All right, I'm super, to ha super excited to have everyone here with me today. Um, we're gonna be talking about building single page applications with Lightning Web Components. Um, my name's Alex Breiner. I'm a Salesforce developer at doTERRA International. Um, there, we're building a lot of cool things on Salesforce. We've been building single page applications, first with Aura, um, then when Lightning Web Components came out, we started building things as well there. Um, it's been really fun this last year, building a lot of things with it. Um, before I get into it, although, I just wanted to quickly go through my forward-looking statement um, just to make purchases based on things that are available today. There are a couple things I'm gonna talk about that are kind of forward-looking. I mean, the Lightning Web Component repo has some RFCs out for things like wire adapters. We're gonna dig into some of that. And uh, some other things that may eventually come available on the platform, but right now it's just in the open source world. Um, so a little bit more about me. I, like I said, I've been a developer at doTERRA International. I've also been a group leader for the Utah Salesforce Developer Group. Um, involved in running the Snowforce uh, convention. This last year I started working on, as you all know, the website. Um, I also enjoy React, Gatsby, Stencil.js. In fact, so Stencil.js is a web component framework that's not built by Salesforce. I started working with it last year when I heard rumors that we were gonna be moving to browser native web components. And I got really excited, so I was like, I'm gonna learn something else to help me understand what it's like to really build with these things. You know, they're a little bit different. They, they required some, just a tiny bit different thinking. I mean, most of it's very familiar, but uh, there were some new things that I had to get into. Um, so before our website was built with uh, WordPress, has a content management system that's pretty awesome. Allows people to just, up, anyone to go in and upload the next contact or the speakers or the sessions that may um, need to be on the website. But I started building it with Stencil.js. I mean, I just barely dove into learning this and the website went down and I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna quickly put something together with this web component framework. And it was pretty fun. I then started missing the CMS aspect of it because you know now everything I'm realizing, I'm seeing the pipeline of all the work I'm about to have, so I was like, I wanna get back into a CMS idea and then so I started building it in Gatsby and then they open source Lightning Web Components. And so like in like four month period, I was like, hopping around too much, but the thing that was exciting to me about Lightning Web Components getting open source, I'm like, I'm, I'm doing all this stuff as my side hobby, it was a lot of fun, but full time I'm working in Lightning Web Components and Aura Components, and this was a really cool chance to bring everything together. You know, it, a lot of times when we're picking these frameworks, it's what do you know, what are you spending your time in? So it's no longer like this, this hop back and forth between these different technologies. Um, and so it was just a, a chance to bring it all together for me. Um, but I, like I said, I, I was working with these other frameworks. I fell in love with some of the ideas that these other, these other platforms came with. Um, one in particular was the idea of a progressive web app. And so with that, I wanna show you real quick some of what the Snowforce site is doing behind the scenes. Um, this right here, I have actually installed on my computer. I have the uh, Snowforce badge right here. I've installed this, I can take this offline and everything continues to work. I can go through, see all the content. And why I really liked this was I really just wanted the app to work. You know, you're walking through our building, if you lose your network connection, I want it to continue working. So I wanted to bring this back in with Lightning Web Components when we got here. So in order to do that, I brought in a few other libraries um, to help along the way. So, I mean, obviously our web development framework is Lightning Web Components. Um, I manage client-side routing with a library called Navigo.js. Um, some of you are probably very familiar with Redux that I use for my state management. And then I use a library from Google called Workbox that I use to help manage my service worker. And we're gonna start digging into all these things. Um, and then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is obviously the component styling that I have there on the slide. So first thing first, so Lightning Web Components. Um, I have here, you can get this, this code is available online in, in the GitHub repo. But this is the folder structure. So up first, I have, I have open here, I have my source folder, client modules, and in here I have all of my Lightning Web Components. And the cool thing about this is these are now namespaced. So I have um, components that are namespaced by the folder they're contained in. Uh, Gatsby did like routing by these, the folder structure, which is kind of fun, but having these namespace components has been awesome because if you're gonna go in and see how my stuff is built, you know exactly how to get there. So if you wanna see my app, compo my app component, that's like my app container, you'll see app-container is the component. So on platform, 
uh, if you're building Lightning Web Components on platform, everything gets namespaced with the, the C. So it's C dash and then your component name. If you want things to work really well between the two, you could have a folder that's just C, and now all your components would be namespaced as C. Um, it's fairly easy to migrate it over. I mean, it's just rename your components and all the references, but I, just, I really like this idea of the structure. So I have my application folder, and that's my root components, gonna hold everything. I also have some like utilities in there. Um, I have a layout for my header and my footer. So I have like layout-header, layout-footer. And it's really cool, as you start building it out, you see just those, that's all the tag name is, layout-header. And so it's pretty easy to navigate around and go back to the code and see it. So then I have down here, just a couple of the things I wanna click through real fast. So I have a resources folder. Um, so I'm gonna talk for a second about like my index.html and index.js. <coughs> it's kind of where that all starts. And then down here, I have a couple files that I'm gonna talk about quite a bit more later. I have a manifest.json and a serv my service worker config file, the SWJS. So first things first, I just wanna differentiate a couple of things. So most of the time when we're building on Salesforce, we're using what's called server-side routing, where when I request a page like snowforce.io slash speakers, I'm gonna send that request for that page and the server is going to return all of the files necessary for snowforce.io slash speakers. Um, it's not gonna be anything else. The server is pretty aware of where I'm going, so whenever I now need to see a new page, I'm gonna send a request and the server is gonna tell me what to do next. But with client-side routing, which is where we're heading, we're gonna start using um, more logic on the front end. So here when my, if you come to my web page and you requested snowforce.io slash speakers, it's gonna go to the server and the server is actually going to respond with snowforce.io and what it takes to just make the web page. And so now it's up to my client side to, or my, my JavaScript logic to then determine, okay, now what needs to go on the page? As part of the, one of the core fundamentals of a single page application is that now all my logic is contained on my client side. The other thing that I have watching my network requests is my service worker. I don't know if you know much about service workers. It's one of the native browser APIs, allows us to do a lot of cool things with caching. Some of the stuff that I've built up with my service worker that now kind of brings in the function I have on platform with Lightning Data Service. So Lightning Data Service, when you request something, like you connect it to Apex, you call your Apex controller, Lightning Data Service has the ability to watch that request, see what comes back, and then cache the response. And it may or may not respond with the cached response the next time around. Salesforce dictates the rules of how this interaction takes place and how it works. Um, and we're gonna actually dig into some code to show how we can now dictate the rules of how we want to do this with our service worker using Workbox. So with that, let's, let's dig into some code. The first thing I do want to show, so I have, I talked about the two things, I'm gonna go back in order. So I have the two, is this, is this big enough? Do I need to go a little bigger? This, this good? So I have here, this is in my app container. So it's namespace app container. This is my overarching component that's holding everything. I've pulled Navigo in here using node modules and I build up my router and I do that inside the constructor of my Lightning Web Component. So here I have all these paths. Like first here I have just empty. This is for my home folder. Um, down you see, okay, then I have like slash about, I have slash speaker, slash ID. Um, what, and what this is doing is I have a, a, a function here that's at the bottom of my page, we'll look, look at this in a second. But what it's doing is it is asking for basically what component do we want to create? So here I'm telling it I wanna create my view home and I pass it the component definition that I grabbed and I'm gonna pass that down to my, my uh, set page function. Um, this one's cool here, so this is all part of Navigo. What, well, that tooltip covers the code. So I have speaker slash and then colon ID. And so I've told Navigo that there's going to be a variable here that I wanna grab. And the cool part about this is, and it fits very well with Lightning Web Components, is it's gonna take that ID and it's going to pass it as a property. So now I have an API-enabled property inside my speaker component that is waiting for the speaker ID and Navigo is gonna just hand that right over to it. So I have all these routes built up. It's pretty well compartmentalized within my app container, so now all my routing logic is in one place, which has been pretty nice. Um, and then I have down here my set page. So set page asks for the tag name, 
the component definition and any properties that I want to pass down. And it goes through something I really wish we had on platform, and that is creating components dynamically. So <laughs> just going to throw that out there. But uh, so with Aura components, we had the ability to do create component, and you could dynamically create a component and inject it into the page. We don't have that ability with Lightning Web components. You need to like already have it defined, do a bunch of if statements. We could pull this off by having a million if statements, and it would work. But uh, right here, we keep it pretty clean with this create component. So I create the element. I assign it the properties. Here, I quickly go through, and this is part of the client side. Um, logic where I go through and I say, okay, first I want to grab everything that's already in my container component and I want to delete it. And then right there at the bottom you see now, then I append my newly created element that I created right here. I just then pump that in. So that's how we're managing client side routing. It's all in one spot and it's been working pretty, pretty nicely. There's a lot more, by the way, before I move on. There's a lot of this stuff online documentation with like Navigo. Here I'm about to dig into Workbox. Um, Lots of resources. I will have links at the end. And of course, you can always go in through the code as well in our GitHub repo. Um, here, I am importing, sorry, take a breath for a second. I am importing Workbox. So Workbox is the library from Google that I'm going to use to manage my service worker. And here, I'm doing something very similar. I am registering all these routes that I want Workbox to pay attention to. So here, I, with a little bit of regex, I have .js and .css files. So any time a .js file or a .css file comes in, I tell Workbox to say, hey, just I want to go network first. I don't want you to cache it. I want you to go network first. Well, I do want you to cache it. I just want to receive only network traffic first. Um, here, anything from my snowforce.io slash API, so my API calls, I want them to Cache the response, it will return the response first, but in the background it will then go and get fresh data and check if there's anything new. Um, down here I have some more, um, I don't know how to say fancy routes, but they're pretty cool. So I have some stuff with like the fonts. It'll cache my fonts for a year because I'm going to need to keep downloading fonts every time you go to the page. Um, I have a, a rule here for pictures. I have max entries 50, so I'm not going to like blow up your phone memory with all my photos. Um, I tell it to keep them alive for two weeks. And if it goes over, I want it to start deleting all my photos. Well, all the photos will go over. <laughs> anyway, so here, like you see, I have like my PNG, GIF, all these different files. Um, and it's been pretty simple. Like, Workbox is pretty cool with the amount of functionality it's brought in to help me fill in this gap where Lightning Data Service was filling it in on platform. It's been pretty fun using that. So with that, the next thing I want to talk about is managing the state of our application. If, if you don't know what the state of my application is, it's like if my menu slid out, now the state of my application is the menu's open. You know, the state of my application could be the data that I pulled down, the page that I'm looking at with that like speaker ID. There's a lot of state that starts to go into my application. And I've managed it with building custom wire adapters that plug into Redux. So if you've been using Lightning Web Components on platform, we have wire adapters that hook into our Apex controllers. And wire is great because it starts to connect things. It connects our Lightning Web Component to Apex, and those two things are now connected. It's reactive. You know, If I change my variables, it's going to go reconnect to Apex and see, OK, now what's going on? With custom wire adapters for Redux, I've kind of built in a it feels very similar to application events with Aura. I have everything subscribing to Redux. I have now connected my components to Redux. I now have components across my whole page that are now all connected through this message bus, essentially, that's running through Redux. And Redux is going to store all my data and pass it across the page. So like when I have my menu open, the things that care that the menu are open are all now going to receive notifications. So I have state management going across my page using these wire adapters. And it's been pretty fun with that. Like That was another one of the points where um, with these wire adapters, it just felt like it fit. And I'll show you some of this as we get into it. So let's look at some more code. This is a coding session. So first things first, this is in my index.js. This is in the very top of the page. You do need to register wire service with Lightning Web Components. Um, if you, later in the, in the presentation, I'll show you if you were to use the synthetic shadow DOM, this is where you would do it. It's in the very top. Lightning Web Components has this idea of some plugins that you can put in um, and start to use with your app. And so one of these plugins that we're adding is this wire service. 
Um, so I've registered my the, I've registered with Lightning Web Components that I'm going to have wire adapters, and here I start to create some wire adapters. I have a connect store function, and this right here is what I'm registering to say, hey, I want to subscribe to Redux. And it's pretty simple. I have some others where it cleans it up a little bit. That last one is like my generic connect to Redux. This one here is I want to wire to my current sponsor list. And I have a couple things that it's doing here, and the documentation for this, um, the documentation is online. I have it listed at the very top of the page I, I put. Um, they, have, they have some pretty good extensive docs on this. I did use also another repo built by one of the uh, Lightning Web Component can, um, maintainers that he, uh, he put on GitHub. I have that listed in my GitHub. It, some really good examples how to create these. Um, but here, so with my current sponsors, I also, one thing I just wanted to point out, I have Redux checking real quick, do I have the sponsors? And if I don't have the sponsors, I need to go get the sponsors. And so now my, my web component is not gonna have to worry about anything. It's literally just going to plug in to my wire adapter and it's gonna start receiving the sponsors as Redux updates and changes. So I have the same thing here with my speakers. I just wanna show what it looks like now calling and creating, or calling and you know, grabbing all the data for my speakers. It's literally just, I'm importing wire service and I'm saying, wire me the current speakers. And so if any time anything on my page starts to update, it, it will then get the updates for this. And I just wanna show real quick, so I have this on my, this is on my computer, it's running ho locally hosted so I can actually see all the debug logs. Um, I'm just clear all this out, my network traffic. And as I open this, so the first thing it does is wire service goes and says, okay, I wanna request sponsors. It receives the sponsors, which then we see down here. As I open the page, you see like slide menu open. Redux, this is standard stuff out of Redux. It's just the Redux logger that I plugged in. Um, it makes it really cool. So I bring up this, I think it's awesome stuff with Redux. One thing I want to just preface, not every application needs Redux, right? Like not every application has bells and whistles and all sorts of stuff going on across the page. I've used Redux quite a bit, building Lightning Web Components on platform, which has been really, I think it's been awesome. When I have had to some, build some like fancy commission tools that our, our customers use, um, there's a lot of stuff going on. And so if you start to find that it's hard to manage, like this is happening and this is happening, I need it to be in this order, you may find, okay, I need to look at something like Redux. It's not required for everything. Granted, like this is so simple, it's not like I really needed to bring Redux in for this. Um, but it does make it kind of fun as I'm clicking through and I'm like, okay, now I see I got this, the speaker data. I can inspect this. I can say, okay, I received the speaker data for 2019. I can now look through all of my speakers. I can see all the data. And if I were to have a problem, I can go through and inspect this and get into further stuff. Um, it's been really fun building with Redux in this. Uh, like I said, not always required, but with how simple some of this code ended up working with subscribing and connecting to Redux, um, this example is how I have to do it usually on platform because I don't have a, access to custom wire adapters, but it does all work. And it really, I like where it's going. It all just seems to fit. But before we go too far into that, I want to talk for a moment. So like I said, we don't have to always use Redux, right? Like Redux is great for state management, but Lightning Web Components also helps to manage state in our application. And I wanna talk for a second, when you start to mix the two, how they fit together. So this is out of the Lightning Web Component documentation. This is just on one of the GitHub pages talking about the Lightning Web Component state model. It goes through this path where the Lightning Web Component framework is watching changes in our JavaScript properties. It goes through and sees, okay, step number one, it's gonna check and see, okay, is the thing that just changed this JavaScript property, is it, um, is it uh, marked as a reactive property? So that's like, if we have tracked elements, wired, like something in, as part of our wire adapter, if we have API-enabled properties, is it one of these things that I need to care about that needs to now refresh the page? If the answer is yes, it's gonna go down, it's gonna find, um, Wow, it jumped right ahead. <laughs> it's gonna go down and say, okay, is there anything that's watching this? So I have this API-enabled property or a tracked property, something needs to be reactive, do I have something watching this? So step number two is like basically these child components. 
Does anything care about my property? And if the answer is yes, it's going to go find the Lightning Web Component that's watching it, and it's going to say, are you already marked as dirty? And I've watched this go through in the code. Like It goes through and it sees, OK, it, it's dirty, it's not dirty. If it's dirty, it goes back and sees if there's another one. If the component is not marked as dirty, it marks the component as dirty and schedules it to come back later. And I just want to emphasize that schedules it to come back later. Because Lightning Web Components is trying to get all of the changes out and then do one re-render cycle so it can stay really performant. Redux, however, is doing everything right now. So you could have a component that gets handed, you know, it has its child, its child component handed its data, and it's now got dirty data. And Redux is gonna come up and say, hey, what do you got there? And we're gonna be handing over dirty data to Redux, and Redux is gonna go across the page, and keep making updates to everything that's subscribed to it with now potentially dirty data, because that refresh is gonna come to later. And if you're like me, and I'm sure some of you also thought it, I definitely did this a few times, where I'm like, okay, well, if it's now and I just have to get past to later, I can just set a timeout, right? So it will go later, and then I, I try it out. So, okay, I get the component, it tells Redux come back later, Redux comes back later, it now has clean data, hands it to Redux, Redux goes and makes the rounds. Now my component has dirty data again somehow, and it hands it back over to Redux, who's now gonna be scheduled for later. And if you didn't catch what's going on there, it's going to keep on going. And I, I'll, I'll repeat that all day. In fact, it, yeah, a few times. A few times, it, it keeps on going until it shuts things down. So I, uh, I want to talk a couple things I found when we're doing this when, to make these things work together. Um, it's best if you pass keys through your API-enabled properties. So my API property, if I receive like the account ID rather than receiving the whole account, it's much less likely that my account ID is going to change something that's going to cause my parent to change, which is going to cause my child account ID to change, right? Like, that recursion is not as likely to happen. I mean, granted, we're developers. We can always pull it off somehow. But um, it works really well. And it keeps everything in sync. It keeps it so that I have all my Redux changes. And then Lightning Web Components cleans it all back up. It's been pretty awesome. Um, keeps things running pretty quickly. Last thing I want to talk about is styling. So I mentioned earlier that we can install the option for the synthetic shadow. It's a plugin for Lightning Web Components. It's actually how things work right now on platform. So on platform, they realized we have SLDS. It's awesome. It, the CSS cascades the whole page. And we kind of want to keep that. We're not ready to move on. So they created synthetic shadow to allow CSS to continue to cascade down through our components. So you get the same borders and the colors and everything. All your CSS classes cascade from the top of the page all the way down, just like you know, how we've always been doing web development. Um, the, one of the things, though, that differentiates these web components, and Lightning Web Components in particular, is we're trying to build something that is contained, portable, can be moved around and used in different use cases. So when we start to do this, now our CSS is dependent, or like the definition, styling of my component is dependent on an outside resource. And so really, I've tried hard to embrace what's next with browser-native shadow DOM when I've been building with these Lightning Web Components. Um, what that does, so I have my DOM, but instead of having the full DOM, my CSS, wow, well, well, my Lightning Web Component has its own kind of like sandboxed browser DOM that it contains. Um, there are a couple ways to pass things through there, but this is really how we're getting this encapsulation now with Lightning Web Components. And the ways that I, I found that work best with passing things through, there are two main options that I've generally gone towards. is one, CSS custom properties, and the other is using relative length units like M's. So you could be measuring out a length of something with pixels. You do it with percentages, that's gonna be a relative length. Um, this one, M's element modifiers, what it does is it sees the font size that it's inherited, and it multiplies off of that. And this traverses that shadow DOM boundary. So if I have a component that's embedded in like a 30 pixel area, so now it's inherited 30 pixels. If I went 2x, now my font size is going to be, or 2m's, my font size will be 2x of the 30, so now 60 pixels. Or you could go smaller, like 0.5m's, and now your, your font size is going to shrink. So that's one way I've got the cascade working. Um, the other way is with these custom properties. And I just want to take some time to talk about this. This is one of the things that I really had to dig in on and 
like realize how some of this worked. I mean, it's pretty simple. Like once I got past that I'm able to basically run variables across the page, um, they're calling them custom properties, but uh, it was really simple. These do cascade, so I defined, this is at the very top of my page in my index.html. I have my primary color that I've defined, and you do it with this dash dash. So anything with a dash dash is a custom property. I've now labeled my primary dash color, and I have a primary dark. I have all these things, and they're actually going to cascade, and I can call them later. In fact, I have one here. This custom property is actually calling another custom property to determine how big it should be. So I'm saying the, the page, my page layout, I don't want it to include the header height, so I take this, I say 100% view height, and then I subtract what I've then defined as the header height. Um, later, when using it in light, the Lightning Web Components, inside my CSS class for my Lightning Web Component, just like normal um, with the CSS, but I can now reference these. So I've referenced it with var, so you, refer, you wrap your uh, custom property that you want to reference inside var, I call it, and then I have comma with a failover. And this enables me to continue with this idea of encapsulated components that don't necessarily need anything else. So if it has the primary color, great. If it doesn't, let's show this gray color. And if I have the header font color, great. Otherwise, let's show some white. Um, I can have multiple failovers. So here, when I'm hovering, I'm like, oh, let's go a little bit darker on hover. But if I don't have dark, let's go with primary color. If I don't have that, then let's go with the gray again. So it just helps with bringing all this back together with creating components that are encapsulated, isolated, and, and reusable. Um, Last thing I just want to wrap up. So I talked for a second about the manifest.json file. This helps me with installing the website on like your phone, on your computer. Um, it's just basically some instructions for the device to say, here is what my component should look like when installed. You know, I have my app name, I have an icon, a start URL, which is start at the beginning usually. Um, with mine, I, I set my display to be standalone, so when you actually open it up, it doesn't have like the back forward button, it's just standalone right there on the page. Um, register with the service worker. This is hosted on Heroku. I've done a few things that are fun with Heroku, and I thought there's tons of options with Heroku. It's been pretty fun with that, and it was pretty simple to get this push there. But uh, anyways, the last thing I just wanted to bring up though with progressive web apps. So I have these requirements listed out here. But the thing about progressive web apps is, like, this is progressive, right? It's going to change next year. It could change the year after that. So just keep that in mind. And uh, you can go reference the docs that we have. Um, the other things I want to bring up. So if when you're going through this, you're like, Alex, that was way too complicated. There's so much going on, all these other libraries. There's an awesome Trailhead badge, or not, it's a project. It's a series of projects where you actually create a simplified conference app. It looks pretty similar, it's awesome. What it does is it takes you through the first steps and then you could say, oh, I kinda like the way that they manage their API calls but now I wanna cache them. So you could then maybe bring in the service worker and start caching them. Um, you could go through and say, okay, this is great with how you manage state, I now wanna start bringing in Redux. So I think the two fit really well together. There have been a lot of things that have been fun seeing how you can now take your own journey to creating a web page with this app and then kind of enhance it how you want. You know, this is basically a series of plugins that I've now gone through um, to sh help show how some of this works. With that, I just want to say thank you, and if we have any questions. I must have done a great job. <laughs> we dig in some more code. I don't know if there's anything you want to see that way. Sure. Um, so when you brought in Redux, uh, most of the documentation, I would imagine, references React. So did you sometimes have a hard time trying to figure things out that weren't really documented for using a non, like a non-React component library? Um, there were, there was one in particular. So I created a, a layer of um, selector functions. So here I have my Redux file. I'll open this up a little bit. Um, and I decided to bring in reselect, which is a way to kind of like temporarily cache. So if you have some really complex stuff, and this is something that I used quite a bit on platform. 
Um, reselect, when you get into some more of the in-depth stuff, it's highly coupled with some stuff that you can do with React that I've been wishing I could, I'll probably dig into more later. But um, I basically, I set up saying, okay, if you wanna get my sessions, you just query my sessions with this function. And it, I've put in quite a few notes here, like you basically call the React store and you dump it right in. Um, I've created my actions, all of, I mean, it's, the whole thing is pretty well coupled with Redux. I mean, not coupled, wow, opposite, it's isolated. Um, there are some functions, though, that do bring in React, like, documentation, but this was probably the hardest one, was when I really got into, like, I wanted to pass variables to reselect, and reselect would bind to um, React get state. I can't remember the exact command now that I'm up here in front of you, but um, it then now binds the reselect library to my React state that I had in that component. But I've worked around it with a few other things. It's, not, it's definitely not the most performant, the way that I've done a couple of them. But reselect is about if you have a lot of calculations it took to perform that query. Um, so like when I have my, my final state in my application, again, not too crazy, but you can see, okay, I have sessions, which right now is looking like I have proxies in my sessions. That's awesome. Um, I have my speakers, and sometimes I was like, okay, I wanted to show only speakers that have an active session for this year, like an approved one. So I, I started the stack queries on top of each other, and so reselect would see the final output of that and then return a cache response if it's not seen any changes. So anyways, it was pretty fun with that. It's, it's again, probably a little extra because it's not necessarily like required to do my simple conference app, but I really wanted to showcase some of what you can do here that we've done on platform at doTERRA. Thanks for that, for that question, that was awesome. <laughs> trying to think through what the next things that are that I would show if I did not, every time I've timed this, I think I must have talked way faster than it was in my head, because holy cow, I have a lot of time now. So, let's see. I don't know, I, I mean, I have my server file that like, actually here's one thing that's kind of fun. So, because I'm hosted on Heroku, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, where are you uh, getting the data from? Are you, is it from the platform or are you storing it separately? That's Postgres or? a great question. So that's what I was actually about to jump into. Okay. So the data that I'm pulling for this, um, I have here, I've just created static files. So. Hosted on a free version of Heroku, you know, they're not some guarantees about their Postgres database. I am doing Heroku Connect to a developer org, which also has pretty strict limits about their API calls. So I have Heroku Connect. Um, I still need to build the last few pieces. I have my Postgres queries running pretty well, but what I want to do is then have like a, a call out to where I actually then dump these files in at any point in time. So I have all my data for this in one place. Um, when you're doing the Lightning Web Component config, you have the option um, as part of your compilation stage, it will walk you through how to say, okay, I want to, let's see, I wanna take my resources, I have them right now in this file, and I want them to end up in this file. So I take my, right now it's in my source file, I have like my fav icon, I want it to end up in my distribution folder as my fav icon. And I did that with all of my data. So I have my resources data, and I wanted to dump that in my data file, so then when I call the API, it goes and grabs that file. So I'm no longer coupled to a Postgres database that's not guaranteed with an SLA or anything like that, so my website will work, even if it's right in the middle of a conference with a down Postgres database. Um, it does, it kind of was an idea I brought from like more Gatsby world, where it's statically compiling your whole web page. So you go through a build phase and statically compile the whole thing and keep it up pretty well on dirt cheap resources. That was another fun question. It's been, it's been a ton of fun doing this. Like it's not, it's definitely not like cut and dry. Like I mean you spin up Gatsby and you want to create a Gatsby or a progressive web app with Gatsby. It's like you click another install package and suddenly you have a progressive web app. But this we definitely had to take a few extra steps which has been kind of fun to walk you through too. About. Um, 
No, that's a good question. So the hardest things are when I've gotten used to some of the open source stuff, and then I try and do the same on platform. Um, like the other day, I tried to have an animation on, on platform that I was working great in my Lightning Web Components open source because it's got synthetic shadow DOM. It's completely scoped. I don't have, like, when you do synthetic shadow, it is compiling on your CSS, putting it up in the top. And the compiler, the Webpack compiler, anyways, it was basically aliasing all my animations with the same thing. And so I only had one animation for the whole page. Like, I actually loaded up my commission page. I was, it was fun. When I moved over, on it, I say fun. It's fun once I figured out what's going on. But I, I showed my product manager, hey, here's my new app with, with the Lightning Web Components. I've made some upgrades. And I open it up, and then all of my charts are all spinning. Instead of growing, they're all spinning. And it's because I had already loaded a spinner, so everything got the same spinner animation. They're all labeled A because it had compressed it. So it's more like that way where it's the open source framework has been pretty cutting edge. Um, there have been a couple things because it's, again, I feel like most of the issues I've had have been CSS where it worked great. You know, scoped, I import a package, scoped my component, I bring it here, and this third-party CSS is now all over my page, affecting stuff that I hadn't previously planned on. Um, so there's just a matter of, I, that's probably the, the biggest thing, is the synthetic shadow kind of, it got me a couple times, but it's not been too bad. All right, well, thank you all for your time. <laughs>